I am one of the people who did not um, actually ask to speak, but um, I know that I um, have a message to give. Um, Strangely enough, three months ago, I guess it was probably, that Kylie told me um, what the theme was going to be for the table and um, that it was going to be life-changing encounters with God. And so immediately a story popped into my head. I kept it to myself because you don't ever want to say, hey, I can speak. Um, The next morning, I got up very early in the morning. I get up early, super early. Um, And in the wee hours of the morning, my mind just began to come alive with um, the details of this story and all that it's meant to me over the many, many, many years. Um, as As a new Christian, it was one that I could relate to Um, with, I I can't, with everything within me, I could relate to that story. And even as um, a more mature Christian, it's still a story that resonates with me each time, like it's the first time. Um, And so I went to, to work the next day, and I told Kylie, I said, I have a story to share. (laughs) I'd like to share with the ladies. And so here I am. I am just really thankful. Um, I stand here as a testament um, that God uses chip china and broken pots. And so I um, never take for granted. I always feel very humbled when he allows me and uses me for his honor and glory. And I know that as exhausted as I am right now, that I am perfectly poised for where he wants because I know that when I am weak, he is strong, and my prayer is that he will come through today. So tonight's message is documented in three of the four Gospels. It's in uh, Matthew 9, Mark 5, and Luke 8, but we're going to be reading in Mark tonight. So Mark was actually the first Gospel that was written, probably written like 50 or 60 A.D., And it was actually, because it was the first gospel written, it was actually used as a source by both Matthew and Luke in their compositions. So it's fast moving, and it talks about the life of Jesus. And I I love the way that Mark writes, because he uses the word and excessively, and he also overuses the word immediately. Much like a little child when they're telling a story, they're really excited, they're going, and we did this, and we did that, and we did this, and we did this, and it was so so fun. They talk really fast, and I feel like when I read Mark, that he's writing like that. So I know that he is telling these stories with great vigor. So um, Mark tells the chronological account of, of the life and teaching of Jesus with emphasis on Jesus' work and his deeds in Galilee as well as the final week of Jesus' life. It is the shortest of the Gospels, but I found it to contain greater detail of this story than the other ones did. Hence, first, you might see Mark 5 is where this story is at, whereas it falls in Matthew 9 or Luke 8 in the other, so it is a much shorter book. So the passage we're going to be studying tonight is nestled between another story, and it's woven together so that we see two beautiful miracles together. There's a healing miracle, and there's a resurrection miracle. So because I want you to have the full context of the story, I'm going to read the full passage. So our story tonight picks up in Mark 5. Jesus had just finished the eight-mile trek across the Sea of Galilee, westward. He had just um, driven the demon out of the man into the herd of pigs, and they had run off the cliff. And the people there were afraid, some mad, and they said, you need to leave. And so he did, got in the boat, went the eight miles across, went over to the other shore of the Sea of Galilee. Immediately when he got there, this is where our story picks up. And it's Mark 5.21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him, and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much more under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. 
For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus perceived in himself that power had gone out from him immediately. And he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion with people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with them and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So it's very interesting. I know that there's, um, there's something about the number 12. Here we have a woman who had had a bleeding disorder for 12 years. And here we have a 12-year-old who Jesus brings back to life. We know that 12 is significant. There were 12 disciples. There were 12 tribes. And we know that the number, although we don't know how significant necessarily, or any research I found, I couldn't find but there has to be something because the disciples found the need to replace Judas with a twelfth again. So there is a little something there with that. So now let's unpack. There was a great crowd that followed him and thronged about him. The definition of throng is a mob, an assembled multitude, a close gathering of people pressing together, moving with urgency. So they're all crammed together. They wanted to see Jesus. They were excited to see Jesus. But then there became urgency because they needed to go. They were headed to save the, to, to heal the little girl. But, verse 25, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. 12 years. Ladies, there were no heating pads back then. There was no Midol. 12 years. Everything within me says, oh my goodness. I'm on the other side of that now. But back in the day, if I hit day five, I was whining. I was like, oh, this is terrible. 12 years. And as, as if that misery weren't enough under the Jewish law because of her bleeding disorder, she would have been declared ceremonially unclean or impure. Under the old covenant, a person could become ceremonial unclean for numerous reasons, childbirth, infectious disease, leprosy, bodily discharge um, related to reproduction, touching a, a corpse, or contact with anyone who was unclean. Leviticus 15, 19 through 30, I'm going to read you this just so that you can feel the heaviness of the woman's 12-year struggle. So Leviticus 15, 19, when a woman has a discharge and the discharge in her body is blood, she shall be in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean. Everything also on which she sits shall be unclean, and whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in 
water and be unclean until the evening, whether it is bed or anything on which she sits. When he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lies with her and her menstrual impurity comes upon him, he shall be unclean for seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of her discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness. Twelve years she was unclean. Every bed on which she lied, all the days of her discharge, she she has to be on her bed. They're all impurity. Everything on which she sits. Oops, I said that from the stage. Not as bad as, well, yes, it probably is as bad as the other one I made. Yes, sorry. (laughs) That's funny. Okay, and, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean as in the uncleanness of her menstrual purity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days. And after that, she shall be clean. And on the eighth day, she shall take two turtle doves and two pigeons and bring them to the priest, to the entrance of the tent of the meeting. And the priest shall use one a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her unclean discharge. This poor woman lived for 12 years. If you're unceremonially, if you're ceremonially unclean, you would not have been permitted to enter the temple for religious ceremonies. According to the law, anyone or anything she touched became unclean as well. And the fact that she was in the crowd pressing around Jesus means that each person she bumped into would have been unclean too, including Jesus. Can you imagine how she felt? Weak from 12 years of bleeding, probably most certainly iron deficient, very lonely, very lonely. I'm sure she had probably very few friends, if any, probably no husband or children. She probably felt very isolated, very desperate. It would be like having COVID for 12 years. Do you remember when we were in isolation, how terrible that was, the disconnect we felt from everyone else? Such despair. Physically and spiritually, she must have just been a wreck. Verse 26, and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She tried all the normal world remedies. She tried many because it said she had suffered under many physicians. So it probably was, yeah, just try this one. Let's see if this works. Let's see if that works. And we all know how fun it is to go to a lady doctor. But the doctors were unable to help. Verse 27, she had heard the reports about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Matthew and Luke say the fringe of the garment. Some translations say the hem. So we know she had to get down very low. We know that Jesus was moving with great speed as his disciples, they were heading to Jairus' house. And so she had to move quickly, desperate. She knew, she had heard about Jesus. This was her one chance. Everything else had failed. She was desperate. She said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. She knew this was her one shot. Her posture was probably... Just in desperation, she saw her opportunity as he was coming. There's Jesus. He was moving so rapidly. And she reached, she reached to, for the hem of his garment. And immediately, the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. All three Gospels say that she was instantly and immediately healed. Can you imagine her instant joy in feeling this in her body? 
that after 12 years, 12 years, she was healed. But that changed rather quickly because verse 30 tells us, and Jesus perceiving in himself that the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd. Who touched my garments? So you have to remember, Jairus' daughter was on her deathbed. Jesus could have kept walking, but he didn't. He didn't. He stopped. Why did he stop? He stopped because he didn't want her to think that there was something magical about his clothes that healed her. He wanted to teach her something about faith. Because genuine faith involves action. Faith that isn't put into action is not faith at all. So when he stopped and he said, who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? Which I think is kind of funny that his disciples humor there. But you have to remember they also had absolutely no idea what had just happened. There was a great throng of people. They were pinballing against each other as they were going, moving quickly through the crowd. They didn't know what had happened. And so like, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know what, what you're, I don't know how, who could have touched you. And Jesus looked around to see who had done it. But he was Jesus. And I think he probably already knew. Probably the man who had the power to heal you would have also known that it was you who touched him. And so I'm wondering if that woman, hearing him say that, was scared. She went from joyous to, oh no, what have I done? I'm unclean and I touched him. He knows what's going on now and this is... So she was like that kid when your kids do something wrong, and you know they did something wrong, but you want them to say they did something wrong. Um, And I feel like this probably was like that. I feel like Jesus knew who it was, um, but he wanted her to say it was me. But she and she did, in fact, do that. That was a trust-building, faith-building moment that we saw her respond. Because she could have just sleeked back into the crowd, but she didn't. The woman, knowing what had happened to her, she came in fear and trembling. And she fell down before him, and she told him the whole truth. I like how Luke writes it. He said, she declared in the presence of all the people why she, an unclean person, and a woman, too, had touched him. But don't miss her posture there. She fell down before him. Truly beautiful things happen when we are on our knees. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. How beautiful that word and those words must have been to her ears. After 12 years of sickness and isolation and exclusion, she belonged. He called her daughter. He called her daughter. I know how special that is. I know that whenever my husband introduces me and said, oh, this is Pam, it's not as impactful to me as when he says, this is my wife, Pam. He could leave off my name just to say wife. It's just endearing. And Jesus called her daughter. Also, because he says, go in peace, it also implies that there was a spiritual healing that took place as well as a physical one. So her faith, so your faith has made you well. Her faith was the instrument by which she was healed. So what is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
I had a friend in our early days at North Point, Carrie was telling me, she said, I had, I had this story of two men who were talking, and it was just such a beautiful illustration of, and helped me understand what faith was. She said, the one man said, you know, I have a hard time believing just, you know, I, I have a hard time believing what I can't see. And so the other man who was a Christian said, okay, I want you to close your eyes and, and open up your hand. So the man, the unbeliever did that, held out his hand, and the man put a quarter in it. And he said, now close your hand. And the man closed it. And he said, now what's in your hand? And he said, it's a coin. And he said, well, how did you know that's a coin? You're right, that's a coin. How did you know it? And he said, because I felt it. And the Christian said, that's how we know because we feel it too. We feel it in here. When you have faith, you feel it in here. It's that faith that gets you through the hard times like Patty was talking about earlier. So I had the privilege of going in September of 2023. Last year was a pretty good year for me. Um, Ups and downs. So I got to go to the Holy Lands in September. That was truly, truly amazing. Um, We were at Magdala by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Let's see if we can put the slide up. There is a, um, it's called the the Duck and Altum, which provides a, that's, that is the coolest place ever, by the way. So it's a chapel that you go in. It is a, um, it provides a place for prayer, teaching, worship. It's, it's kind of non-denominational. The building is dedicated to the public life of Jesus and is transforming encounters. So this picture, oopsie, the other one. Can you go back to the other one? Okay, so what you don't see about the boat, this is actually called the boat room which everyone loved to stay in, because when you sit in the pews, those are pews on the bottom part, when you sit in those pews, the person who's preaching sits on the, they preach from the boat, which is really cool. But that water behind them, that's the Sea of Galilee. So when you're sitting in a pew, it looks like you're listening to someone preach in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. So that was really super cool. There were a lot of people who really liked that room. But in the lower level of that church in that building, there was called an encounter chapel, which was dedicated to Jesus' encounter with all of us. It was an illustration of the large painting titled Encounter on the back of the chapel wall. And on the floor, um, can you go to the other? Yes, that one. So that's a huge, huge painting. I can't even tell you how large it is. It's at least the back side of the stage there. And you can see the stone on the floor beneath it. That is actual stone that was, um, that was in the, the century, the marketplace of the Magdala Port. So that is the original flooring. People walked on that, and they believed their strong tradition that that is actually the spot where she was healed, where the woman reached for the, for the hem of Jesus' garment. And so they did this big mural Um, I'm pretty sure the pedicures weren't that great back in the day. But you can get the gist as you see the woman's finger grabbing for the fringe and the power coming from her finger. I stood there. Everyone else wanted to go to the boat room because it seemed to be cooler for them. But I stood there for a very long time. And I remembered again all that that story had meant to me. How many times in my life I've just felt empty, hurting, and I just thought, oh, if I could just grab the hem of Jesus' garment, everything would be okay. So that was in September. The end of October, um, we were having a women's retreat called Make Room. Uh, My my daughter was very close to delivering my first grandbaby. And so I was super excited with that and didn't want to commit to go on the retreat. Um, and I felt like, um, so I, I felt like I honestly, I, I, like I shouldn't sign up to do anything substantial there because I didn't know if I'd be able to fulfill the commitment because my daughter was my number one priority. Because when I got the phone call, shoom, I was going to go. So um, I had low expectations for the weekend. It was really an easy, super easy lift for me, unlike everyone else on the team who was just really pulling very hard. I got there early. I did help decorate and set up. And so Kylie had ordered these cool shirts someone made, and they have words on them. So the shirts were all folded up, and as she's stuffing them in the bags, she didn't 
looked to see, you know, she didn't choose the words. She just randomly, she said, I'm not going to choose the word. I'm just going to pick in the bag, let, let God pick the, the word for each person. So she just took the, whatever size you needed and stuck it in your bag. So, of course, I was helping her with the bags. I'm like, oh, I want to see which I get. Let me see my shirt. And I pulled it out, and when I saw Beloved, my eyes filled with tears, and I didn't quite understand why. But I had told Kylie, it's been months and months ago, I had told her, I said, I feel like there's some things in the corner of my heart that I haven't fully surrendered to God. I don't know what it is, but I feel like there's some, this needs a little bit of housekeeping in there. There's just something tucked way back in there. I don't know how it got in there, but it's something in there, and I just can't get it out. Well, the first night of the, of the retreat, um, Kylie spoke on the things that, how to recognize the things in your life that don't belong. Things like busyness, sin, your past, religious rules, all of those things take a valuable space in our hearts and in our lives, and they erode away our time for the better things. Then the next day, um, Christina Taylor spoke, and she spoke on Make Room for Truth. And through that talk, I discovered why I had cried when I saw my shirt. And it was because I discovered that in that nook, in that cranny in my heart that was tucked away, that I'd never surrendered, was a lie that Satan had told me that I was not worthy to be loved. That maybe if I were a little prettier or a little smaller or a little smarter or a little more perfect or tried a little harder, that I could somehow earn earn his love and maybe be worthy of love then and I don't understand why I have I have no problem encouraging anyone else I will be your best cheerleader but for myself I just failed to see that in myself so after Christina spoke and the tears were flowing by then the close of the session the worship team came up and they began to sing And at that point, I reached for the hem of Jesus' garment again. We had a little makeshift altar that was tucked into the back room, and I knelt on the pillows that were there, and I gave that lie to God. As the words to the song were echoing in the background, here is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. This is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. In times of desperation, we don't have to worry about the correct way to reach out to God. We try to make it more than what it is, but it's not. It's not. We don't even have to chase after God. We think we do. We can simply reach out in faith, and he's going to respond. We feel our problems will keep us from God, and we should never, never, ever let that keep us from God. And we should never allow fear to keep us from reaching out and approaching God. That weekend was truly life-changing for me. And the following weekend was, too, as my grandbaby came into this world. And baby Brent was all that I had hoped he would be. And I found myself, as he was in the NICU on a ventilator, once again reaching for the hem of Jesus' garment and praying, please, dear God, don't let my grandbaby die before my eyes. He was so tiny and so frail. So as many of you know, or maybe you don't know, um, I am on staff here. I am Pastor Steve's assistant. But what you might not know about me is that I actually have a full-time job in addition to that job. So what that looks like is that I get up super early in the morning, Monday through Friday mornings. I get up the last two nights, last two mornings, I've gotten up at 2 o'clock in the morning so that I can get done the work that I need to for the other job, so that I can come and do this job. 
So it's been a difficult season. Two years ago, Pastor Steve had asked me um, if I would be his assistant. I've loved his family. I've known them forever and ever. Um, I used to stand in the back of our church when we first started, um, and I would hold Jada or Jordan, whichever one. Jana and I would stand in the back with the twins because they were just little babies. So I've known his family forever. And I told him at the time, I said, well, you know, I can't do full-time because I already got full-time gig. And I know that that full-time job I have is one that God gave me after my mom passed away um, 30 years. And it was the job that allowed me to stay home and raise my kids. And so I don't want to give that job up because when my daughter has a baby, I want to be able to take care of that baby so that she can work because I know what a blessing that was for me to be able to know that my child was safe when I went to work. So he said, well, you know, I could do part-time. Part-time is good. I said, okay, I can do part-time. So also last year on December the 8th, or sorry, December 10th, which was also another it's a pretty low point, um, Sadly, I got to ride in an ambulance for the first time and I, as I was picked up in the Kidman hallway and taken away to the hospital for an extreme um, medical condition. So um, at that point, um, I again reached for the hem of, of Jesus' garment because I knew I needed some healing. Um, I knew that I couldn't go on the way that I had been going on. Um, as much as I love, 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 um, being here, I was praying, God, what do I do? What do I do? What can I let go? What can I, what can I do? I also turned 60 two weeks after the ambulance ride, which also is, you know, anyone, anytime you have one of those birthdays with a zero on the end, it's just like a stop sign that just bam, and that's what it felt like. So in, in praying um, and pondering, um, I have resigned my job here. So I am not going anywhere. Um, I actually worked here for 18 years um, prior to coming on staff. I was one of the. I was actually the first um, pastoral assistant. Have a cool little card with a little logo on it and everything that I helped pick out whenever we started 20 years ago. 20 years ago, um, I was 40. I was a baby then, uh, and it has been a tremendous, tremendous ride. So I want you guys to know that. There is a misconception that exists that people on the church staff only work one day a week. <laughs> that is not so. I can tell you that is not so. <laughs> Do not think that that is the case. And I can also tell you that many hands make light work. So even though I'm stepping off of staff, I'm going to continue to stay here and I'm going to continue to serve because that's what we're called to do. And what I want to challenge you guys to, 20 years ago, we did actually prior to that, even 20 years, at our, the mother church of this one, Belmont Baptist, we did um, Experiencing God. And Henry Blackaby in that study says, find where God is at work and join him in that work. It's what we should do. And it's what you should do. So if you are not... I encourage you to jump on board. You will find great connection in serving. You will find fellowship in serving. And I will tell you, nothing fills my love tank like serving the Lord. So, we now have a staff member on staff, Pastor Robbie, who would love to help make that possible for you. So, if you are not connected anywhere... Let him know, let me know, let Kylie know, and we will get you plugged in. Because genuine faith involves action. We saw that in the story today. Faith that isn't put into action is not faith at all. We have our 20th anniversary next weekend, an opportunity for you to connect with other people, an opportunity for you to dip your foot into that serving pool maybe there is a job for you so I wanted to bounce back to that slide the last slide one of the things I wanted to tell you in the duck de altum the um can you go back on the slide um the pillar that one 
Okay, so in the atrium, there's a woman's atrium in the foyer of that church. It honors women of the Bible. It features eight pillars. It's a grand, beautiful, beautiful atrium with a real ornate ceiling on it. And there are these huge pillars. And they represent, seven of them represent women in the Bible. This one says Mary Magdalene on it, who follow Jesus. While the eighth one honors women of faith across all time. It is an unmarked pillar for women who love God and live by faith. I want to challenge you each to be able to put your name on that pillar, to be a woman who loves God and lives by faith. Let me pray for you. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I am so um, in awe of you always, Lord. I love that you, um, that you use us, Lord, even when we think we're unusable. I thank you that you love me, Lord, even when I don't think there's anything in me to love, Lord. I thank you that we don't have to get down on a, um, a hard stone street, Lord, to touch the hem of your garment that we can just call out to you, Lord, in prayer, and we know, as your word says, that you hear us. You may not heal us, but you are always there with us, Lord, in whatever storm we're in, whatever trial we're in, Lord. You may not answer our requests the way that we want, but you answer them according to your will, Father God. And that's where faith and trust come in. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us to build those faith and trust muscles, Lord as we seek to know you better, Lord. I pray that we would be a people who tell others about you. I pray that we would show others and we would put our faith into action, Lord, in serving. I pray right now that the, as the ladies go into a time of discussion at the tables, Lord, that you would help them to search their hearts and areas, Lord, that they need to, to trust you things that they need to give you, Lord, maybe some cobwebs in the corner of their heart that haven't been surrendered, Lord, that are, that are just it's time to clean them out, Lord. And so I pray that they would be bold and they would be brave and that they would know that this is a safe space to share with one another, Father. I thank you for this community of women, how they hold each other up. I thank you for the honor of being able to pray for them, Lord, as a staff. I've loved my time on staff here. I have learned so much from you and been able to see you so incredibly clearly. It has been an honor and a privilege to have a front row seat to all that you're doing and to see all how you're working in everyone's lives, Father. You are truly amazing, and I thank you for choosing each of us to be yours. In Jesus' name, amen.